Good morning, afternoon, and night, everyone. This is Ana Maria de Balogosen. I would like to welcome you to this wonderful panel where we will enjoy from passionate people that are dedicating their life projects to make the world a green place in one hour conversation. They will have time to answer to your questions in the end, so don't forget to write them in the Q&A box. Let's discover together if we can find possible solutions for a green future and without pandemics. I am a Venezuelan visual storyteller and member of Ayun Photographers, a collective of eight women photographers united by Latin America. Today, we're going to open up this amazing panel discussion with our first collective photo project, The Nature That Inhabits Us, supported by National Geographic Society. Then we'll hear from our brilliant panelists, Jules Cognard, Anna Jonah, Philip Guante, and James Whitlow Delano who will touch on the solutions for a green future and without pandemics through their dedicated work and unique insight. We're so lucky and honored to have them here with us today to share their expertise and knowledge with us. Anna Yona is the CEO of Wilding Shoes, which is a successful brand of shoes that are respectful to the natural shape of your feet, but also to the environment. Jules Cognard is the co-founder of Circulaire, which is the first global network of circular economy um, startups. Philip Guante is a senior product manager in a leading renewable company. And James Whitlow Delano is a documentary photographer focused on human rights and founder of the Instagram account, Everyday Climate Change. Thanks to all of you again for taking the time to be with, here with us today. It is truly a privilege. Now um, I'm going to show you a short video of our Ayun photo project, The Nature That Inhabits Us. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Go, go, go. <laughs> cuando se va acá. Cuando soy una hormiga te voy a morder. Y las hormigas cuando le pisas el hormiguero se enojan y te muerden.
So uh, I would hear a round of applause, but normally you know, somewhere on Zoom, so that doesn't count. Um, now, I am also going to present a short video of who we are as a collective and what this project in. So we are a collective of women storytellers united by Latin America. We are Andrea Hernandez, Daniela Villasana, Yohis Alarcón, Carla Gachet, um, Marisa Huertal, Sara Pabst, and Tamara Merino. Together, we form a collective that is united by Latin America. Supported by the National Geographic Society, our project called The Nature That Inhabits Us explores the problems leading up to the pandemic, such as environmental deterioration, destruction, and exploitation, as well as overpopulation, pollution, and the detachment from nature. The origin of the coronavirus had it's proven once again that environmental destruction reduces biodiversity, which in turn reduces regulation of diseases. Even more alarming, the United Nations Environment Program also states that as climate continues to change, outbreaks or epidemic diseases may rise frequently. While the COVID-19 pandemic has brought human life around the world to a screeching halt, Nature has revealed and thrived in our absence, providing a rare glimpse into the efficacy of measures that can be taken to curb our negative impact on the planet. This unprecedented time in our collective history shows that humans are undeniably interrelated with nature and that a human populace imbalance depends on a planet imbalance. If we do not take these lessons with us into the future, society is at a grave risk of repeating the same mistakes that lead us to a global pandemic in the first place. So today we're going to hear from this phenomenal panelist about some of these lessons. And with that, I'm super honored to introduce our first panelist, Jules Cognac who is a passionate French entrepreneur about the environment and co-founder of Circulaire, which is the first international network of startups in the circular economy. Their aim is to accelerate the transition from a linear, take, make, dispose, to a circular economy model, which is respectful of the planet and to the people. He also lives in Biarritz, and his office is right in front of the ocean so he can go surfing straight after work. <laughs> Thank you, Anna, and uh, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm very excited and, uh, and very happy to be here with you guys, especially in French. We, we are beginning another lockdown, so it's, it's nice to hear good stories and, and how we can uh, make a different world. Um, I'm going to talk about circular economy. Um, I, I did a, a tour around the world, a travel around the world to meet with circular economy entrepreneurs, and actually we met there, Anna, in, uh, in Hamburg. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen really quickly. Uh, can you see my screen, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So I'm going to start yes. quickly with, with this picture. Uh, it's a picture we took in Senegal. This is a lake you, you're looking at. So as you can guess, it used to be a lake. Now it's one of the biggest landfill in Western Africa. It's called the Lac Mebus. Every day, 2,000 tons of waste are ending up there. And for me, it illustrates pretty well the stupidity and absurdity of our current model. As for everything we see in the picture, we had to use resources, water, energy, manpower. And now it's being here, being useless. And of course, worse, way worse than useless is damaging both people and the planet. As 3,000 people are working straight uh, on the landfill, so it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any environmental sense, doesn't make any social sense, doesn't make any economic sense, as everything there doesn't have any value anymore. So uh, as we were digging into the topic, uh, I came across the circular economy concepts, which is giving kind of solutions to that, using natural resources in a smart way to live in a world without waste. In, in some way, circular economy is, is making the economy work as nature. In nature, there is not any like waste, you know, uh, waste picking up, uh, and there is no such thing as waste because nature is working in a perfect and harmony way for millions of years. 
And I would say if nature was an economic system, it would be the best system in the world because it can work for millions of years. And I believe it's kind of a hope message. I believe we can do the same as humans, having a society, a system where there is no such thing as waste, a system where we can live for millions of years. And especially now as we we are here with the pandemic, I guess the circular economy, there are three main advantages in a, from a resilience perspective. First is on the climate. If we were to do circular economy only for five like big materials like cement or plastic, for instance, we, we would reduce the CO2 emissions by 40%, which is, which, which is great, of course. Uh, again, if we were to do circular economy, we, we would create more local jobs and more jobs. Only for France, we could create up to 500,000 jobs in the coming years if we were to, to, to go to have a circular economy model. And at least, and we can see with the crisis now, businesses are going down, but I believe like environmental business um, can still you know, grow in a, in, a, in a smart and in a sustainable manner. Uh, in circular, in, 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 only for Europe, we could save up to 600, 600 billion euros every year if we would just reuse the resource there instead of, you know, extracting new resources. I'm going to give two examples of innovations we met around the world during the world tour. Um, first one being this material. Uh, I, I'll let you a few seconds to guess what kind of material is used for the packaging. I'm not talking about the glass powder. I'm, I'm talking about the other packaging. It's something that grows into a mold. This is a startup from New York doing this material. It's mushrooms. So you have actually like mycelium mushrooms growing into a mold. And then, you know, you're taking it out. You heat it for a few, few moments. And then you have a biodegradable packaging, actually an organic packaging that replace expanded polystyrene, for instance. Good thing is that when the packaging grows, it's actually getting the CO2 um, instead of emitting it. And, you know, the end life of this kind of packaging is great as you can really compost it. Another example I'm going to give um, is the city of Kamikatsu in Japan. So when we travel in Japan, we, we saw a lot of projects happening there. I guess there is a lot, a lot of work to do in Japan and in this little town in the, in the countryside of Kamikatsu, they sold their waste in way more categories than we do has actually sold their waste in 45 categories. And, you know, it's, it's, it, it's actually a hope message as well, saying that, yes, we can change stuff, we can change things, but we need to be, you know, we need to build kind of resilient systems, working together with both citizens uh, and, and companies. And in this city, you know, in the kind of message is clear for the citizen. Uh, if you see the different buckets, it's quite clear there what goes, what kind of waste goes there, what it's going to become, and how, how, how much it costs to the society or what it brings. And I think the transparency in the communications towards citizens is key to develop uh, sustainable models. And in this city, particular city, they have kind of a kuru kuru shop, which, is, which means circular in Japanese. And it's, it's a shop where people can exchange uh, goods that they don't have to use anymore. So it comes together with a global system that make it happen. Um, I know there are way more people to talk after me. So I'm going to actually end there and, and hopefully get questions afterwards. And I'm going to end with this quote uh, from President Obama, which I, li which I love, uh, which is that we are the first generation to feel the effect of climate change and also the last generation who can do something about it. Uh, as a personal and professional um, manner, it's something that really drives me. And I hope it's the same for everyone. And I'm looking forward to hear from the other panelists and maybe get questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jules. Um, it is so important that those words <laughs> that seem so apart from each other, economy and nature, start coming together in harmony, right? So, yeah. yeah. So with that, um, with that thought, I want to introduce our next panelist, Anna Yona, who is very clearly a person that embodies that harmony. She is the CEO of Waddling Shoes, a company that produces shoes that adapt organically to our beautiful feet, but also they are made of sustainable materials produced in fair conditions. This company is acting as a movement towards a more sustainable way of produ production and consumption. Anna will be touching on COVID's impact on companies like hers and how and where we can become drivers of change. Thank you so much, Anita. 
Um, let me see if I can share my screen. I've learned something today. Let's see if I can still do it. I hope you can all see my screen. Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Yes. So I just want to, to quickly give you um, an overview of what we're doing and how I think that also companies can take part in being a movement, being change drivers. Um, I founded Wildling in 2015 with my husband and our goal was to make shoes um, that would allow people to move freely, um, to move as nature intended, to be as little shoe as possible. And of course, um, to produce them with sustainable materials and under fair conditions. Um, but we also saw that this is really not easy to do um, and that there's a long way. Um, it's really a journey. Um, but our vision is also to do more than that. We want to move people, to let people move naturally, but we also want to be part of a movement that we can help create or that we can participate in. And we want to be a driver of change. Um, I believe that um, in, during the pandemic, we could see that we can change a lot, actually, also as a society. Like if everybody changes some things, the effects can be enormous. And I think that um, also not only as individuals, but as companies, we really have a responsibility. And we don't only have a responsibility for the profit that we make, but we also have a responsibility for the people and the planet. Um, and I, I really think that we must look ourselves in the eye and ask ourselves, are we really assuming that responsibility? Are we really doing enough? Um, and I do believe that we must question our values and our actions to really as companies. And I think there will be areas that we can identify that, you know, we are causing harm because we're using resources or we, you know, we have to transport goods or do something. And I think in these areas, what we can do is to reduce our harm to as little harm as possible, like to basically minimize it to zero. But I don't think that this is enough. I, I do think that, you know, on top, we should identify areas in which we can actually have a positive impact. And um, for Wilding, we identified a few areas that can actually help us make a positive impact. And one of those is, for example, how we source our raw materials. Um, I do believe that there are practices that you know can do more good than they do harm. For example, we can you know support nature reserves and 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 grazing um, projects by purchasing our materials from there. We can start implementing um, regenerative agriculture, agricultural practices um, to where how we grow, for example, the fiber, the hemp, the line, and the nettle that we use in our shoes. Um, and I think if we do that, we can actually um, cause more good than we cause harm. So that's one thing. And I think also as companies, we need to question ourselves, like, where is enough? Like, where is the end? How far can we go? Um, you know, in an ecosystem, there's a perfect balance. And I think that balance is only there because, you know, nature also knows the limits and acts within those limits. And I think we as companies, we can't say we want to go faster, higher, further. Uh, but we also need to see, okay, how, where's the limit? How much am I allowed to take from the system? And how much do I need to give back into it so that it can actually work? Um, so also, I think financially, like companies can use their financial power and also the, you know, the team capacities, the resources um, to support projects. Like for us, um, that will be rewilding projects. There are great organizations that are actually um, working um, on rewilding our planet. I think that's also a, a balance that is truly needed um, to, to get us back to a more balanced system. And, you know, we can support these um, projects financially. We can try and craft our own projects um, and we can also, you know, um, engage our own team uh, with corporate volunteering to help, you know, in, in actively um, helping these projects come along. And um, the last point that I'd like to make um, we can also, you know, companies are always thinking about how can we um, sell more products? How can we, you know, make people buy something? Like, why don't we use that communication skills? Um, why don't we use that, that budget and that power um, to be transparent and, and to, you know, inspire people to do things? Um, you know, we, we can 
we can go out and, and show what we're doing, but we can also show, you know, what, what's working well, what is successful, um, and then hopefully inspire others to do similar things, like other companies that can see how it's working, other people, other con our consumers um, that can make um, more responsible choices. So I think, you know, if we do this, um, if we assume our responsibility, and if we communicate the right things, then, you know, with many small steps in the right direction, I think we can reach a positive tipping point together. And, and this should become like a global movement of, of, you know, all these people also that are here today um, and that I believe we can all together really make a change. Okay, did I stop sharing my screen? I hope so. Yes, thank you. That was amazing. <laughs> It's really uplifting to see that our companies like Wilding Shoes and like you um, taking the responsibility to, to create awareness to a balanced planet, no? So thank you for, for illustrating that today and for your work. Next, we have here with us Philip Guante, who is an industrial engineer with an international mindset who has dedicated his professional career to renewable energy. He has worked as a business development manager at one of the main wind turbine manufacturers in Hamburg and Bilbao. He is also my partner and one of the most positive persons I know regarding our future as a species. And he's also the bassist and the piano player of our song for the most <laughs> with a unit. So Philip is going to talk about the challenges of renewable energies um, who are currently facing with the, with the COVID-19 pandemic and a current outlook about the renewables growth versus target. So please, Philip, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, it's really an honor. So um, yeah, today I want to talk about renewables. Uh, I try to stay also brief in five minutes and why these, in my point of view, are the key for a green future. First of all, um, I want to give a brief introduction to what kind of renewable sources exist currently. So the most common technologies that most of you know are onshore wind and offshore wind power. Um, also, onshore has been the cheapest renewable source for the past 20 years. Offshore is heavily growing, also um, floating offshore in France and Portugal, for example. And then hydropower is probably the oldest renewable source that we know uh, when they take power out of rivers. And then um, actually the biggest one right now on a yearly installed base and also the biggest growing one is solar. Not only as you can see here on the bottom uh, for big parks, but especially also as you know it on rooftops and so on. Uh, it's getting becoming more and more cheaper and is currently in terms of installed megawatts per year, gigawatts, the biggest. And then some of you might know alternative renewables, um, they are smaller, um, bioenergy or biofuels, you probably see it on the gas station that are put into, are uh, mixed with our normal fuels and then geothermal uh, other ones could either be used in the heat of the earth to heat your home, but many times it's also used in power plants to generate electricity. And there are niche technologies which are, let's say, more on a smaller scale, could be tidal energy. So when the currents uh, move between uh, high and low tides, uh, often in river mouths to the ocean, you would install such turbines you can see on the top, or also wave energy. You can see it's kind of a snake. When it moves, the waves create, uh, produce energy. Um, and there are a lot of different technologies which are uh, rather explored than being used on a, on a commercial basis. In my point of view, also what is very crucial is, is storage and grid technologies. So at night we won't have solar and winter time you have less solar energy. So if, if we're going to be at some stage 100% renewable, we need to see how to store the energy, not only in the short term, like you can see in lithium ion, but also in the long term, which could be hydrogen or there are tons of other technologies I, I won't be able to go into, into details today, but I think you have all heard of those. Um, yeah, here, I just want to show where are we heading, actually, if you look at the current policies around the world. Um, we all know that, that glo the, the, the climate is, is, the temperature is rising globally. And um, today, if you look here, um, where we're heading, so this is the share of total energy consumption. I'm not talking about electricity, but total energy consumption. Uh, renewables will in 2050 at the current rate only make 25% of that. And um, that will lead to, to a temperature rise from of above two and a half, rather three percent, which is going to be severe for the generations to come. And um, that's why I say here in the title that we need a strong increase of renewables in order to, to be able to stay below two or one and a half, even better. Um, and renewables need to grow above 66 percent by 2050. 
and that goes hand in hand. It's not about only producing renewable energy, but it's also about being more efficient in the way we use energy and we waste energy. And that starts at home, um, but it's also about um, getting more efficient processes in place in the industry and so on. And that you can see currently we have a rate of 1.8% in improvement. We're heading towards 2.6 and this is far away from where we need to be. If those two go hand in hand, we might be able to achieve the targets that we set uh, for the global temp temperature rises. And um, the question of today panels is also what impact did COVID-19 have on renewables and, and um, all the economies, the global economy has been hit. Also, in, yeah, you can see that, that um, there was a dip in, in installed capacity this year, but what I believe that wouldn't stop um, the growth rate that renewables see currently, but it's still, as I said, not enough as a, in, in, at the current rate. Um, but I believe that COVID-19 might be even a turning point um, towards a greener future, and that has several reasons. First of all, I think since the pandemic, health has been in the center of everyone. Also, clean air, um, you know, renewable energy. So, yeah, it's it's people are getting more conscious about um, those topics, and and that has also caused behavioral changes. We were forced, partly, as you can see here, to have uh, not a, not to see each other uh, in person, but we have to telework. Um, I, I haven't traveled for my business for at least half a year, right? Even on vacation, you cannot go far away. And people started to, to do vacation more locally and save energy. And the question is, do those behavioral changes last or is it something which will vanish after the pandemic? I, I hope, I strongly hope that this has a long lasting change in people. And then I believe that, that all of us are very dependent, more and more dependent on electricity, right? All the mobile application run on servers. Um, so, it's expected that until 2030, electricity demand will rise, but at some stage, it, there should be also a tipping point where we will need less um, energy and be more efficient. And by now, I think a couple of years ago, it started that renewables have become the cheapest source of energy. Um, people often don't know that nuclear and carbon also have been subsidized. But if you compare really the, the generation costs, renewables are not only the cleanest, but also the cheapest by now. And therefore, there's no way to avoid those in the future. And I think, when now um, not only the EU, the entire world is talking about how to recover from this pandemic and this economic crisis, I think the transition towards a clean energy future should be the center and people should fight for that. And a last point I want to make is what can you do as an individual to change, right? That's not straightforward when we talk about renewable energy. I remember when I, when I lived um, in Hamburg, I changed in the first year to a renewable um, source. So, so my electricity utility, I changed it um, to a provider that, that was only sourcing from renewable energies um, and thereby directly supporting them. Um, of course, when I don't want to say whom you should select, but in maybe one of the criteria when you select a party could also be one that really supports renewable and green energy um, and other eco um, ecological aspects. And there might be also, Anna has done a great project also locally about um, young people that fight on different projects uh, for a yeah, cleaner future for the next generations to come. And then lastly, what can you do as an individual? I believe I told you it's not only about producing renewable energy, but it's also about saving energy. So it's about using energy saving lights, about unplugging stuff you don't use at night because they all use energy if you don't unplug them, efficient heating in winter. And then what I stated also earlier, travel behavior, right? So people started this year to go with a camper, be more local in your travels. And that might change, right? Do you re often do you for your work have to fly around the globe all the time to meet people, or can you do it in the future also through live meetings? I think that are questions that anyone or everyone should ask himself. I think I remember that once at lunch I discussed with my colleagues what actually we can do. I think it's tough because it does influence your 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 behaviors, your daily life, but it's something that you as an individual can do um, to switch and also push this change and transition to a more and greener future. Yeah, with that, I would stop this. And, I, and maybe there are more Q&As I can answer if you want to go deeper in some of the topics. Thanks. Amazing. Thank you so much, Philip, for that incredible insight to renewable energies. We still have a long road ahead, but so far we have learned that we can all collaborate and move forward together. Last but not least, we have um, James Whitlow Delano here with us, who is also a photographer focused on human rights and a Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting grantee, 
as well as the creator of the Instagram free everyday climate change. He is based in Tokyo, so for him it is around one in the morning. Uh, one forty. <laughs> thank you. So but I'm an I'm a I'm a night hawk. Uh, well, thank you. Um, it's really a pleasure. First of all, I, I deal a lot with the problems of climate change. I document it. I mentioned to all of you uh, that Asia has seen more environmental destruction in the last uh, 70 years than any region has ever seen in the history of humanity. Uh, so I'm, I'm really enthused to, to see solutions and can talk about sources of climate change. But what I want to share with you is a, a uh, chance encounter with an epidemic uh, caused by the same drivers as COVID-19 six months before the global pandemic with an indigenous group that I've been documenting for uh, a decade. <clears throat> and these peoples, the Batek, for uh, a quarter of a, of a century, actually. Um, it was only after COVID that I realized the echoes of the current pandemic. And this is a short film uh, describing and trying to make connections about the environmental destruction and how it contributed to this pandemic and their epidemic, same causes. And let me see if I can share the screen with you. Uh, can you see? Yes, you can. I hope you can hear it. Let me know. Perfect. Yes, I will let you know. Nature is talking to us. But are we listening?
it was measles, zoonotic like COVID-19, the zoonotic virus passed from animals to humans. The Bontek who have lived here for tens of thousands of years, the Bontek who have lived here for tens of thousands of years, say they know the measles, and this was different. contact with potentially lethal zoonotic viruses SARS, like Ebola, SARS, Zika, Zika and now, now COVID-19. Deforestation, mining, Deforestation, and, the mining and the expansion of agriculture, they say have created a perfect storm for zoonotic spillover disease from animals to us. Back again. So pretty intense, but um, it's what it's what's happening. It's the same drivers. Thank you, guys. Thank you, James. And Thank it's you. true what you say. It's uh, it's like nature is trying to say something, and we are not listening, right? Exactly. Thank you so much again um, to you and to all the panelists for this incredible insight. Some of it is sobering, of course, but what certainly it is is that we can learn and hopefully uh, not repeat the same mistakes in the future. So we have a lot of questions um, from the audience. Thank you again, um, thank you again everyone for tuning in. It's really exciting to have all of you here with us. Um, so I'm going to start really quickly with the questions. Um, I'm going to start with one that I think everyone, um, or every panelist can answer from their own experience and I think it's interesting. So the first question is, if I wanted a job, where I contributed to a greener, safer climate and environment, where would I start? To you guys. And please turn on your mics because no one is listening if you're answering. If you want, uh, Anna, I can start and uh, then people will uh, complete. Go ahead. Uh, it's, it's, it's of course a, a, a great question and a lot of people and that's a good thing are asking these questions to themselves right now. Uh, I would say the good thing is you, you can be a bit anywhere and asking yourself this question and act um, within your organization. So it can be a citizen organization, it can be a company, it can be an NGO, it can be a government organization, anywhere you are. I, I guess you can do something for the environment. Um, in my case, I left my job to, 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 to create a, a different structure to do it, but I don't necessarily believe you, you can do that. You have to do that. Uh, I strongly believe anyone can do it anywhere. The, the only thing is asking yourself within what you are doing now, can you do something better for the environment? 
as a professional, I'm, I'm saying, because on a personal manner, of course, you can do it as well. And if not, then maybe eventually change of structure to do it. But I mean, anyone in, within any organization should be able to do something to, to make it better, or to, you know, to, to, de to diminish the impact of its own organization uh, or to have a positive impact. And that, that, that would be my uh, recommendation. Yeah. yeah. I also think that that's a good answer. I think uh, wherever you work, um, it's about, for example, if, if you work in procurement, are, are you using uh, suppliers that, um, that that have a sustainable business or are you procuring somewhere where shite labor is fostered or where you, you, you're damaging the environment, right? Also, if, if some, maybe you're manufacturing cars, but are you, the electricity you use, is that renewable? Or uh, what are you using, right? It's, um, I know, Maybe they're not the cleanest, but if you even look at the big companies, Amazon, Facebook, all those guys, at least they try the servers to be 100% renewable, right? They they, um, they they try to make those, um, yeah, those centers where where all our mobiles run or the applications run on to 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 get them directly fed with renewable energy at least for the next I think 10 years. And also I heard this week that our company I don't want to talk about them actually, but. Uh, that all our manufacturing halls are now provided with 100% clean energy. So I think there are a couple of things that, that you can do and try to change the culture within your company and wherever you work. Right? Yeah. I absolutely agree with you, with both of you. I, I think everybody can make a change. And I think um, the biggest problem is um, if we think that we can't change something. I think we just, we must really believe in being able to change things. And I think if you come with a strong for a change um, then you can um, get other people to believe in that and you know if it's your boss or if it's uh, just a colleague or you know if, if you don't get anywhere then yes by all means go and you know do something differently show people that it can be done um, but it's it's more in us I think than than in the system that like we need to change yeah. that from within. yeah if I could say from the outs as an outsider uh, to the green business as an observer um, I think that, you know, if you're a young person, you don't have to start a business. You can think about what can I, uh, what sort of skills can I, um, obtain like Philip with, uh, being an engineer and seek out companies like Anna's, uh, or Philip's work or Jules, where you can learn from them, uh, about the business, about what's possible, about what's out there. And then you can gain skills and then go out on your own. You don't have to start a business from the from day one it's it's a it's a process and it's a, as they were saying uh, a way of thinking great thank you um so i have a question for jules that can be an evolution <laughs> from his answer how can we be responsible for every step we take concerning a green future Oh, that's the billion dollar question here. <laughs> How can we be responsible in every step we take in the future? Well, I think the, the answer is actually in the question. Uh, the, my, my recommendation would be in any step you're, you're making. So, of course, it can be a personal step. How can I be responsible in my personal manner, in the way I consume, in how I reduce my consumption, in how I choose to consume in a sustainable way, how I can... Uh, of course, sort my waste and compost, and there are so many things you can do in a personal manner. And, and everything you do, tr you know, try to get better and better. I, I love what Anna said on, on how to believe we can make a change, and that's that's really the the key points. <clears throat> and then you know, don't don't like kill yourself because you're not perfect yet. Uh, I'm definitely not perfect in a personal way, but I try to get better uh, every time. And I think it's the same. This is, you can apply it to your personal life and you can apply it to your professional life. And how, how can I make this, you know, try to get this vision and how, where I want to be in maybe 10 years and then what, are gonna be, what is going to be my starting point. And then, okay, I make this, I success, I'm happy because I'm getting a, a, a biggest impact on the planet in, in, a, in a positive way. And then I get, I get make my second step and, and so on and so on. And there are so many things you can do, but you know, just keep the optimism, um, keep the vision of where you want to go and, and, and then try slow and, and, and slow and poco a poco, you're going to get there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so talking about being positive, James, 
We have a question. <laughs> okay. A better future from photography. How can photographers act for a better future? Well, I mean, we have a lot of power. Um, there is that old saying that a photo is worth a thousand words. Uh, there, is, there are things you can say in a photograph that can have impact beyond words. Uh, photographers have to be there as well. We have to go out in the field. We can't write about it. We can't tell the stories we have to show. Uh, now I've chosen to be a canary in the coal mine, but everyday climate change, for example, and, and uh, Danielle is part of everyday projects. Um, what I'm starting to do now is, is uh, bring in organizations. And this is something I could do with some of the panelists maybe to show their work to bring in more um, solutions based as opposed to showing what's wrong, showing what's possible and what's right. And I'm, I'm very excited about a lot of these projects um, because the answers are out there, the technology is available and photographers can show. Uh, we can be the eyes and part of everyday climate change is that I can't be particularly with COVID. I can't be all over the world. We have people in all over the world living in their localities and telling their stories. So photography can be evidence-based, but it can be also very emotional and very local. You think global, uh, act local, or rather think local, act globally. Uh, but yeah, so we can be the eyes and uh, we, can, we can forecast what's ahead. We can show possibilities and it doesn't always have to be negative. Yeah, so it's a matter of the narrative you're using to, to be, um, to show whatever you want to show, to tell the stories you want to tell sometimes. Right. Um, I have a very good question for Anna, but um, it might take like another panel to answer it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I'm very, I'm very, very curious. What are, the change, what are the changes from an individual level and as a leader of a company that we can adopt to thrive without harming, harming the environment? Okay, I hope I'm getting the question right. What are the changes? Yes. On an individual level and as a leader of a company? Um, I'm really, I'm really not sure I'm getting the question. Can, can, can you repeat it's it? It's basically, um, what are, I mean, what are the changes that we as a person can do? That we can do. As, a, as, a, as an individual, but I think what is more important is what, as a leader of a company as yours, that, that you adopted to not, to try not to harm the environment, to do as less harm as possible. All right. Uh, well, it's a really huge question. So I um, <laughs> hope I can get it together in a few sentences. I think it's, it's pretty much what also Jules said. Um, it's kind of becoming aware of the different steps that you're doing. It's, it's kind of digging in and wanting to find out. Like it, it's about going really in, in depth and not um, staying on the, on the, yeah, like in a superficial manner. Um, and I think it's also not to be afraid because when you start digging, when, when you start discovering, when you, when you want to find out, you will find out things that are not pleasant or that are difficult or complex. And um, I think you, it's okay to accept that as a journey, like especially if you want to, you know, change your way a company's working or, or become kind of like start driving change. Um, it's a really, really long road, and I think that's fine. I think a lot of people are scared to, you know, to, to deal with matters of sustainability or to, to tackle that problem because they know it's huge and they kind of shy away from it. And maybe they also, they are scared that people might, you know, criticize them on, on things that are, they are not doing yet. So I think instead we need to be, like, optimistic. We need to, um, like to start with the first steps. I think that's really important. Like this way is really long. So if you're trying to look at, you know, at your goal, where you're going to get to, um, that can be really, you know, you can lose hope. Um, so what you really need to do is to just, you know, get up on that day and start making the first changes and then going the next, next steps. And, you know, bringing people with you, getting your team on board, getting the right people on board also, but you know, uniting 
on common values, on a common vision, and to know where you want to get to. And then it's just kind of, you know, making a few small steps every day. And then, you know, at some point you look back and you see that you've come some way and, you know, then it kind of gives you back energy also to continue going. Thank you. Thank you so much. So one last question for you um, patient um, spectators in our panel to Philip. Um, what are multinationals doing today to migrate consumers to green energy? Is it the role of governments to regulate firms or do firms have a societal obligation, for example, to fight climate change? <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's also a difficult question to answer. I think it's, it's maybe both. Um, I think it's, um, of course, it's not always good if, if it's a top-down approach that government force companies um, to be green, right? I don't think that is always possible. Um, for example, renewables, it, it had to start with the subsidies. It's with new technologies, it's always this way. And then once they're fully developed, right, and competitive, then you can take that out and then it runs on itself. Um, and the other question is, should, yeah, I think if the pressure, like if, what I said also before, right? If, if, if the society wants uh, green, yeah, green companies, if, I mean, I don't know if all the labels are true that, that say, you know, this has been done sustainably or people are willing to pay maybe a little more for, for stuff that has been produced ecologically and sustainable. I think if, if this pressure is there from society and, and, and the big companies notice that people have a look at that, I believe then, then, then there does need to be pressure from the government that would do it on themselves, right? I think um, I can see that at least in my company also that um, people want to work like our society now or people in companies look for more purpose. It's not about just making money. It's more, you know, what I do on a daily basis needs to have a purpose that I can identify myself with. And therefore they expect the company also to act in this way, right? So I think that that makes people go get up in the morning and go to work and I hope you know, if, if people get more conscious about this environment and all the topics and this panel helps that, then um, I think this pressure is on the companies to change, right? And then you will see, and I think you can see that in supermarkets, right? The variety on, on sustainable stuff, on ecological stuff is popping up everywhere. And that, that is not because um, they just want to, it's just because I think the society is, is changing slowly into that direction. I hope that answers. Uh, yes. So one of our attendees wrote us an answer to the question, why do they expect to learn from our panelists tonight this answer? To find ways for me to take steps into a greener life. Little steps for me and my family to save the planet. We are running out of time, but I feel that we came <laughs> a little bit closer to get some hints of what can get us, you know, to that, to that beautiful world, to a beautiful phrase that says, save the planet, no? So I'm just going to say a massive, massive thank you to our brilliant panelists from tonight and um, to everyone that is in the audience. We hope that we can inspire you and learn as much as we did. I also want to thank Danielle and Sarah for being my tech fairies tonight. And uh, <laughs> please don't forget to follow us on social media. We are Ayun Photographers and we will be coming with more surprises before this year ends. Not that we're not excited about what 2021 will bring us. I hope you all have a wonderful day and see you soon. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.